Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another exciting podcast interview today. I'm so pleased to have Rudy Thune. He's the head of Roadster Operations, and we're going to be talking about the state of modern retailing and, well, how have things been since Roadster was acquired by CDK Global? Rudy, welcome to the show. Nice uh, to be talking today, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so there's a lot of momentum building for, you know, changing the retail experience. We're hearing uh, OEMs talk about it. We're also hearing uh, some thoughts about consumer direct sales, at least for the EV models that GM and Ford uh, plan to roll out. But before we get into some of the more controversial pieces, uh, for the dealers who are listening to today's podcast, because I get this question, hey, Brian, how are things at Roadster since CDK, CDK uh, acquired them? Um, how have things been? Yeah, it's, so we're, what are we, we're about nine, 10 months in uh, post-acquisition. And yeah, it's definitely an adjustment going from pure startup mode into you know, a larger publicly traded company. Um, but I've, I've certainly done that before uh, in my career, uh, so no surprises. Um, you know, I think the, the most important thing to me in, in, in my job and, you know, just being happy at work is innovating and, you know, fast product development, you know, real velocity there. Once you get addicted to that, and I think that's, you know, for the last few years with Roadster, that's, that's the feeling I had. Uh, you want to keep going and we haven't slowed down. In fact, we, we doubled the team size and uh, continue to move really fast. So it's been, it's been good. And we're making good progress. Um, so I love really to good. hear that. I love to hear that because, you know, I knew from the beginning that this was a good fit from my perspective, knowing you, you never know how politics works. So I'm glad to hear that you have an even wider runway. So let's get to that follow-up question. Um, what has the team been focused on? I mean, there has uh, been, I would say, pretty measurable change year after year over the last five years in this general category of moving the online transaction uh, mm -hmm. to, to a full complete car sale. What, what have you been focusing on? Yeah, lots of good stuff. In the early days, right, we're getting much tighter uh, integrated with Ely. And so the initial 90, 100 days was focused on, you know, data compatibility there and making sure the data was flowing, um, you know, relatively basic stuff, but super important. Um, and then, you know, starting to really um, um, look at data and how we can rationalize across the company with Roadster and, and some of the other uh, products, you know, how, how can we be smarter about how we're leveraging data and making sure the data is flowing. Um, and, and then, you know, after that, it, you know, really starting to focus on the end to end solution. So get those initial pieces in place and then start building out the additional modules so that dealers can have a much more robust end-to-end uh, -end solution. And, and that's the stuff I, I, you know, I was referencing before that I'm most excited about. Yeah. So when, you know, every company, when they, you have a new kind of field, you, you build the roadmap, you project out what features. Obviously, CDK had already built a number of the features that a full end-to-end -end retailing system would need. How has CDK's existing robust platform of of software products uh, changed or enhanced your vision or roadmap for the next year or two? That's a good question. And I think there's a few different players in the space that have rolled up quite a few good assets uh, through the years. And then the challenge is always, okay, you know, are they gonna be siloed? Are they gonna truly be integrated? And um, I think that's the key here, right? There's, you know, it still takes anywhere from six to eight tabs to be open on a, on a browser to complete a deal. And so, you know, um, that's, that's, you know, CDK has the pieces. And, and by the way, it doesn't have to be all only CDK pieces, right? We can integrate with other third parties, but it has the pieces and, and now the key is to stitch them together. And that is the rationalization of the data. And it's creating APIs that, that link up all those different components. And easier said than done, right? Uh, it doesn't right. happen overnight, but you know, that's, that's 
where, where I think CDK has leveraged Roadster well in, in trying to unify those different pieces. And, you know, obviously the integration with the DMS has always been, I think, the hardest piece for startups who want to engage in modernizing automotive retail software. You basically have, you know, the direct development teams for the CDK DMS, which uh, I assume probably has the largest market share at this Mm -hmm. point. Um, How has the product integration with a DMS um, evolved over these last 10, 11 months? Is there anything specific that jumps out? Like if, if somebody is a CDK DMS customer and isn't using Roadster, is there something kind of a, like a juicy uh, tidbit that really yeah. makes it easier? I mean, at, at a high level, right? It's, it's about making, making the, the, the DMS less of a monolith and, and abstracting out different services that can be lightweight and easy to integrate with. And that's that's a lot of the work that you know I'm talking about here as far as what Roadster's been working on. It's not about Roadster, it's about how do we create these lightweight services that can be leveraged across the stack and across other people's stacks too. Um, whether that's you know desking or credit uh, or F and I, all these different pieces um, really could be they, they don't need to necessarily live in the DMS. They can be services that are abstracted out and and then uh, much more easily accessed. Uh, through APIs, and so that's that's the general strategy, and um, I think you know it's been effective so far, um, and we've made a lot of progress in, in, in that roadmap. Great, and and before we jump into a bigger topic of you know how do dealers and OEMs kind of work collaboratively in a in a modern retail environment, um, I would like to you know just bring up that there seems to be some consolidation going on in the digital retailing space. Obviously your acquisition was a key one. Some other products have been acquired by larger companies. Some seem to be marginalized. Even one company, Modal, shut down. Does it surprise you that we're starting to see some of that early consolidation movement, some some acquisitions, some uh, just shutting their doors. Mm-hmm. It seems like a very, very competitive space, and it needs a high level of of mm-hmm. uh, investment. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, it, um, what I was more surprised by was how long it took for the consolidation to start happening. It's certainly not done yet. There's, you know, I, I've seen different counts. I think you've surveyed people, and obviously, DR definitions are. Uh, pretty broad in many cases, and you know there might be forty different vendors out there that are touching DR. But um, you know, I think I think we've we've seen the first stage of significant consolidation, and I expect uh, a few more to to drop to. There's probably another three or four, uh, I would say, solutions that probably don't make it. Your your point about investment is spot on. Uh, it requires an incredible amount of product to really pull off end to end digital commerce. And, and so, you know, you're talking not millions, you know, not tens of millions, but, you know, 50, $100 million worth of product investment to really get to, to where you need to be. And, and that happens over the course of years. So I think we're, you know, we've seen consolidation. We'll see, we'll see more over the next 12 months. Yeah. And I, and I, I, you know, expected that, of course, many others have commented, there just can't be that many players because at the end, it seems like, well, we need to decide if a model exists where OEMs and their, their needs and data sharing requirements and dealer groups can meet in the middle somewhere. I've written a number of articles on LinkedIn, and I hope our listeners are subscribed to my LinkedIn newsletter called Modern Retailing. Mm-hmm. But the idea that maybe because there isn't a standard Uh, exchange of data, uh, a common framework to move data from DMS to digital retailing into OEM systems, it seems on the surface that some OEMs have decided to go a single solution end to end, which of course creates a lot of problems for dealer groups who've invested Mm -hmm. now millions of dollars in uh, sales process training, technology, branding, 
So, Rudy, from your standpoint, it's always great to win an OEM deal. It really <laughs> sucks when you lose an OEM deal. I'm trying to say, hey, there should be an interchange hub which the main digital retailing players can all mm -hmm. exchange data and still give OEMs that end-to-end -end picture of the shopping journey. What, what, what's your current thinking on that? Yeah, I think you're right. Like, it, you know, exclusive deals are nice, but you know, when you win them, when when you're on the outside looking in, that's that's tough. I mean, the the way I kind of look at it is so. First of all, I think every OEM that's making these decisions and, and making these decisions, hopefully with their dealer councils is really coming up with a, a sound strategy and thinking about what the workflows are, are really like in reality, not what they wish they would be. And so, you know, establishing, Hey, are we, are we focusing on omni-channel here? Do we think this is going to be hundred percent online, right? You got to make that decision about uh, what the overall strategy is and how the retail network is going to be a part of that. And, you know, we've been, singing about omni-channel for five, six years now. And, and I, I truly believe you need to nail that. Um, so, so then it just comes down to like, all right, what are the data points? Like how is the, the OEM going to actually measure success? Or were they going to put their money where their data is uh, a phrase I like to say. And I think that's where we're, we're struggling a little bit as an industry. I think we could, we could probably unpack that a little further here, but you know, that's, you being very clear about what metrics are being measured, then holding your own platform, you know, to a certain standard or the vendors that you're working with to certain standards and let the best platform win. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to advocate. I spoke at the star standard committee meeting at NADA presented a framework. Um, since that meeting, a few companies have come up to me and said, Hey, we believe we could provide that real time data interchange. Uh, those conversations uh, are still live, and I hope by November mm -hmm. we will have something more to talk about as an industry, but we're going to pick up the conversation again at DMSC, and my thought process here is that somebody is selling the OEMs that the simplification of the car buying process is fairly easy, <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. dealers are saying, hold on, you know, we're going to have people coming in uh, to buy a car in the next few years uh, that are going to be so upside down in their existing vehicle um, mm -hmm. with rising interest rates. We're going to have more and more of a challenge to uh, get people financed and let alone who's going to handle the trade, who's going mm -hmm. to dictate which F&I products can be sold to a consumer. and it seems to me that maybe the OEMs are oversimplifying what online buying is and, and that buying a EV vehicle is so much different. I don't, I don't buy that. Maybe if it's a very basic car with very little options, but I mean, take a look at the Ford Bronco with all the different trim packages yeah. and engine packages. I mean, I don't see a consumer knowing exactly how to do all that online. Yeah. There's a subset of the population that wants a very efficient online process. They know what they want. They're going to go through it. We know that that's a small percentage of shoppers. You can over-index on the Tesla sort of approach and, and, and try to map that to the rest of the population. And that's probably a mistake for a lot of these brands, at least. So that's why, you know, your point um, earlier and, and, and mine as well about omni-channel is key. And that's why the, the stakes are high, right? Trying to connect the dots from all the online activity, as well as what's happened at the, the tier three retail level, um, requires a pretty sophisticated solution. Now, you, the, the companies that are good at this make this, the, the complicated or sophisticated solution seem simple. Uh, but, you know, that's why there's only going to be a couple solutions that ultimately, you know, win the day here. It is a, it is a complex challenge. Yeah. And I, and I see that. I mean, what I do believe is that the car buying experience should be simplified to the degree that the consumer wants. Number one, number two, I believe that uh, the customer is a shared uh, responsibility, meaning that the dealer doesn't own the customer and the, the OEM doesn't own. It's a shared uh, experience. 
and that OEM should be able to see if somebody comes on tier one, starts to configure a car, that information is pushed down to tier three, they should be able to see how often the dealer's communicating, what happens inside the showroom, and, and what led them to buy or what led them to walk out not buying. Of course, the OEM doesn't have that information uh, today, and I can understand why they would want. I think that's a reasonable thing, but... My thought process has been, hey, if a dealer loves the simplicity of the Roadster workflows and have built a training process around it and a brand process around it, um, a dealer group wants to be able to move managers from one store to another and to be able to move salespeople from one store to another. And if each OEM has their own platform, man, that seems like a big data mess. And then... If that is the case, and there's a lot of small companies that these OEMs are relying on, I wonder what happens if there's not another meltdown. One or two OEMs put all their eggs in one basket, and all of a sudden, yeah, that smaller company just can't deliver. Yeah, I think you got to be realistic about that. Um, you know, we keep getting back to this point about investment and. It's nice to be able to control a small vendor and tell, and tell them what to do. Uh, but if, if, if you become overly dependent on uh, a company that's also not learning from other uh, OEMs and um, you know, <laughs> data that's coming through the pipes, uh, that's also a, a challenge. So you know, I think this it really does. It, it gets back to, to the data. What's nice about, I don't know if you want to call it digital retailing, but digital commerce and, and getting these platforms um, into you know, a, da- you know, a common data uh, structure that you can actually you know, glean information from, uh, that's the first thing that OEMs really need to be doing is just standardizing what is it that they want to measure from these digital experiences. If you can't get that foundational piece right, you're gonna be chasing your tail all the way through. You're gonna be making, you're gonna either have the wrong data which then you'll make bad decisions off of, or you know, you're flying in the dark and you're making decisions because somebody likes something better than something else, right? Um, and, and that's where I think you can help a lot um, with your focus on data and, and helping the industry just sort of steer it to the, to the right metrics and, and the right visibility. Yeah, so what I'm trying to do, and, and Rudy, you know, because I've talked to you, is I'm trying to get together the key leaders in this digital retailing space to have a conversation uh, with maybe some independent, um, uh, you know, middle middleware provider that is stable enough and sturdy enough to provide a real time interchange, so that if somebody is desking a deal in Roadster, but the OEM prefers, you know, some other, you know, platform for the roll up, great. Every time something is changed in the desking tool in real time, mm-hmm. you know, the OEM's platform can be updated. It makes, you know, so much sense. Um, we, we experience that in other products. I mean, we, we have phones that share texting information and videos, and yet mm-hmm. there's a Samsung phone and it's an Apple phone and it's a Google phone um, because there's some, some standards. So uh, I'm hoping over the next few months to make some more progress. But you brought up a good point. uh, The simplification of these workflows is gonna be key uh, because the dealers have to realize that the OEMs are thinking of a single end-to-end solution because they believe that's the only way they can force a simplified retail experience. I don't believe that. I believe dealer choice and innovation is gonna drive the day, but let's, be clear, dealers have not changed their retail sales process fundamentally in any major way over the last 30 years. So how is CDK and Roadster working to simplify these workflows, uh, do a better job with integration so that Mm -hmm. if an OEM walks into a dealer who's a CDK dealer with the Roadster platform, they can look at that and say, wow, why are we reinventing the wheel? Um, this is an example of a really streamlined, simple retail process. Yeah. So a couple of points here. One is, you know, I, 
<laughs> that that eight tab problem. If if you're still requiring people to log into you know seven, six to ten systems to get the deal done, you know, in two years from now, we've we've really failed. Uh, <laughs> and you know, you you'll know it when you see a simplified workflow because right now it's obvious that it's not. Um, and you know that there's there's an elegance to to how you design that, and and that all comes down to product and UX. Um, so there's that, but the other piece is like, you can have the greatest software and if, if no one's using it, uh, it doesn't really matter either. So, you know, the, the other area of investment that has been super important to me and, and Roadster and, and CDK is, is success teams. And, you know, the, the, these behaviors um, just never change easily. I would still say that, you know, if I look across our spectrum of dealers, uh, you know, probably it's the, the, the rule of the thirds, you know, a third of our dealers are really embracing the change and, and, and moving forward, you know, another third are sort of ambivalent. And if they're told to do it, they'll do it. And then the other third just resist, resist, resist. And so if you don't follow up and that could be the OEM with some of their training resources, uh, it's the, uh, you know, DR vendor that really needs to bring resources to the table to help train uh, these behavioral changes even if your your software is beautiful and works really really well, it's not enough. You know, one of the um, still puzzling pieces because I've seen data from all different places, so I don't know who to believe, Rudy. So I'll mm-hmm. ask you an updated question, mm-hmm. completely out of the blue. You know, one of the things with um, digital retailing, as we want to call it, or the price discovery of a vehicle has typically been a gated experience. So we do not show uh, anything other than MSRP for some manufacturers, but if, and, and granted, most cars are being sold at MSRP, but in a, in a real world, we have this idea that Manufacturers want leads, so they fabricate this rule that you can't show anything less than an MSRP. And if you want to show something less that has to be gated, the customer has to give them information. So we've moved to either conversational unlocks or form-based unlocks. And then the customer then, let's just say, has a full set of robust tools to configure, get an estimate on their trade. Has there been any updated study uh, from Roadster on whether the lock versus unlock for OEMs that don't require, you know, if, if a dealer is allowed to advertise a car under MSRP, is there any update on the consumer's true throughput, uh, mm-hmm. whether the lock is there at the beginning or not? It's a loaded question. There's a lot of different, um, pieces to this and how you actually handle unlocks and, um, you know, when they happen um, and for what different activities. Um, so I think you're, it's, it, it, what's kind of cool right now, to be honest, is you know, the fact that we are selling cars at MSRP, consumers might not love that, but it's giving us uh, an opportunity to see, you know, more uh, activity without uh, an unlock required. And it's, it's putting, um, it's making everyone sort of rethink I think that strategy, we are seeing quite a bit more activity uh, just across our platform in general. I think some of that's from our product improvements and and different things we've done. Uh, But I think it's also just, you know, this new condition that we've got where people are less locked by a pricing scenario and are just diving in eager to get a credit app through the system. Um, They accept the price is, is what it is. And now it's all about the other activities. So it's it's kind of cool to see that. Um, I don't I, I don't think we ever go back to the way it, it was before entirely. I mean, I think the prices are going to be high for a while. We get an inventory constrained you know world here for the next probably two years. Um, so we're getting the data, and it's pretty compelling. You know, let shoppers get into the experience, let them explore, and they become a lot more committed to the experience overall. Um, so I, I, I mean, we do have the data. I, I can't tell you where it's thirty percent better. Even back when we did have uh, the, the 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 locks on, we did see the the the, the sites that were open didn't require them lock. You you definitely got deeper engagement. Yeah. Did you get as many leads? No, you actually didn't. 
It, does, it doesn't mean they're all going to provide you the, the, the contact info online later in the process because you didn't lock the price. Uh, so there were less leads, but the overall engagement was 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 pretty deep. And then the thing you really got to look at is like, how are you doing on your car sales? Like, are those That's people right. coming into the store and ultimately transacting? The stores that always really were uptight about losing those unlocked leads, and, and, and they would insist upon it. You know, if we took it off, and I would always ask them, how, how are you doing? How is your business after you took, you got less leads, but are you selling cars? And every single time they're selling cars. Yeah. You know, and, and what I was trying to, I'm glad you brought up the recent pricing because early on when I was working in Minnesota, doing some consulting with dealers who are one price, so Maury's and Walzer and Luther were all, it was kind of like a one price haven, you know, and yep. then later on uh, visiting other dealerships in that model that the, when price was taken off the table, you really got into, you know, allowing consumers and the employees to, to really just get involved in the sales process. And, and that's mm -hmm. why I think, uh, I think whether it's a fixed price or one price or MSRP, it does really change some of the limitations of online tools because once the price is established, then payments can be established. If price oh. is still hanging up in the air, then digital retailing fails. And that's where, you know, maybe that's where the OEMs are going that, hey, we're going to sell these cars at MSRP because they know if they did a national sales portal and, and prices were negotiated, uh, they could never do it in scale. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, the price is, is a lot of different pieces, right? It's not just, you know, what is the, um, the selling price of the car. It, it's the rates. It's the, uh, the trade-in value, right? It's your F&I products, right? Each one of those things is like a, um, a scary step for a lot of stores still. Uh, but if you really are willing to, to, you know, come up with a fair price that's still profitable for you, you will see the engagement shoppers are happy to go through that process if you're willing to be open and honest with them in that experience. Um, but, but, but everyone at the store needs to, to embrace that. And that's, you know, it's, you know, it takes leadership. So let's fast forward a little bit. You've been really working on integrating the CDK platform products. You've been working on simplifying the workflows. So it's easier for dealers and dealer groups to get uh, retailing done. And obviously you're investing a, a lot of money. Um, do we see more closed systems in the future? Meaning you'll pick the CDK retailing platform or you'll pick the Reynolds retailing platform or the Cox retailing platform and it's one or the other? Or do you feel that there will be an acceleration uh, or a more openness in, in open APIs without, you know, penalty clauses? Where, what do you look to see in two or three years from now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think there's phases, right? We've, we've gone through a few different phases already. Uh, you know, the initial phase might have been, hey, we're going to have six or seven certified vendors. And, you know, we just want to simplify things to that level, but it's still a lot. Um, and then, you know, start gathering data fr from those vendors. and Maybe they're some of the OEMs are pulling back to two or three as, as uh, it's clear who's kind of emerging. Um, and, then, and then you get to the stage where, you know, the OEM says, yeah, we, we really do need to invest here. And, you know, we are going to own that UX and that experience up front. Uh, and, 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 you know, whether it's our own resources or we're going to hire an agency and we're going to build an experience and then we're going to have APIs and work with those, you know, anywhere from two to four or five vendors. And then, and then start getting the data from that. Right. That's it's it's and I think that's that's smart, right? Look, don't don't assume you you can totally pick the winner unless you've got some experience with this, um, and and let the data show you what's working and not working, and it will be dramatic. I can tell you, we get data from uh, OEMs and you know shift or redacted data. We don't know who's who, but you can see the, the differences between different platforms. It's dramatic. Yeah. That should inform decisions. So you know if. I do think ultimately you start 
you know, calling back and, you know, there'll be a lot of single source or maybe it's two or three. We're going to keep getting winnowing it down. But the key here is letting the data drive those decisions and, and making sure that the things that matter to the OEM in that digital experience are the things that they're really measuring. So it's happening. We're, we're probably in, you know, if you like to use those baseball analogies, the nine innings, right? We're probably in the, uh, you know, middle, middle innings here, you know, fourth, fifth inning of that process. Yeah, I, I see that it's going to be critically important uh, for this acceleration to happen. And, and here's why. I think for years, and dealers have asked me, why all of a sudden? Why now? And I don't think it's just COVID, but I think that the OEMs have realized in other peer industries that are this large with that much consumer touch points, they have no control over the consumer data. They just don't. They don't have much control over what's happening in the showrooms. And of course, the franchise model still uh, allows a lot of creativity. And I think they're just saying, look, you know, in the past, I let you pick whatever destiny tool, whatever DMS you want to use, whatever CRM, what, whatever website, whatever. And, you know, the list goes down 20 different tools. But the problem with that is, is that as the consumer pops into your retail establishment, we have no visibility into anything uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is really useful for us to improving our brand, our brand experience, brand perception mm -hmm. and saying, hey, dealers, look, um, Everyone else is working with their franchisees to create a more transparent data model. We need that. And I get that. What I, what I don't understand, and, and you said it uh, perfectly, is I, unless you can guarantee with 100% certainty that picking one company to do the whole end-to-end -end retail uh, is going to be the best thing without any hiccups or, or any increased liability. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that has never happened in automotive retail. And, and I'm just wondering that, yes, I think there's a winnowing of the field, but I, I'm challenging the OEMs. What if there was a real-time data exchange mm -hmm. that allowed you to, in a sense, virtually have four or five chosen you know, uh, technology companies all sending the same signals when the desking is happening or when the uh, mm -hmm. F&I is happening uh, so that uh, Roadster could be sending uh, mm -hmm. signals, Cox, uh, digital retailing, uh, Gubbagoo, uh, Carna, whatever. Uh, and why wouldn't you let the data show which company is innovating the customer experience the best? That's, yep. that's what I'm hoping, Rudy. And I'm yep. glad you see it that way, because at the end of the day, if we only have one choice, I think we lose out on innovation. I think we lose out on time to market because, um, well, there's no motivation for the incumbent when they're the only player to mm -hmm. move as quickly. It just, it's just human nature, right? Yeah, I mean that we would call it the activity feed, um, you know, events from the from the different activities that are happening in the process, and I think that's right. Yeah, you know, I think there are some OEMs that have they're deeper into this cycle than others. They've they've gone through that process of either you know single sourcing somebody and then realizing well that's not quite what we needed, or they've gone and you know worked with three or four vendors and they've gotten to understand dynamics, like what makes one vendor different from another. And so some of those, I mean, they might be in the seventh or eighth inning or ninth inning almost. Um, I, I can think of a couple, um, you know, off the top of my head, you, you just, you, you got to do your homework and you, you, you might say, all right, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to make the commitment because I've, I've learned my hard lessons and off I go. Uh, but if you don't, if you haven't learned those lessons yet, you're, you're not probably in a great position to do that. Uh, you know, one last thing I wanted to talk about before we end our, our discussion. And of course, we're going to be picking up this discussion live in the Napa Valley. Inventory shortages have really exposed some weaknesses in the online experience. I've shown dealers in an article I wrote in my newsletter that for many websites, if a dealer doesn't have a model in stock, it doesn't even show. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, it's surprising that for many dealers, this still is not fixed. Um, but I did mention that in the Roadster configuration, there's always a model showing uh, for uh, 
uh, a consumer. But uh, it does, at, at least in previous versions, it wasn't a build to order tool. It was more of a, uh, I would call it a placeholder um, with uh, a certain package or configurations. Where are we in mm -hmm. the ability of Roadster uh, to, uh, I, I, most people have been able to identify in transit vehicles, but what about letting Roadster build the car to the yeah. same degree as it could be on an OEM site? Yeah, so we've been, we've had a pretty robust, we call it build your own capability, you know, since 2014, 2015, we spent the time and we, we understand build data too and, and packages incredibly well. That was our sort of in our DNA, how we started the business uh, as a direct to consumer um, business back in, you know, 2014, 2015 timeframe. So we cut our teeth a lot back then. And that's been a core part of our experience. And it's in, in a lot of ways, I think it's better than, than some of the OEM configurators. Um, you know, we would love to work closely with any of the OEMs that are open to, to it, uh, to keep improving our build your own, but it's, it's used a lot by our dealers. And I think that's, that's one, um, component in this inventory constrained. That's one tool set in this inventory constrained world. Uh, there's plenty of other things that we, I think, you know, I wish if I'd known this inventory situation was going to be many years. And I think we all feel this way. We would have jumped on some of this stuff earlier, uh, but the ability to, you know, essentially create uh, a car from scratch that you can then uh, do a digital experience off of is also key, whether that's in a car that's inbound and not in a feed, but you have information for it. Like we've built those tools out so that you can create a, you know, call it a virtual car um, and, and start transacting on that too, on a one-to-one -one basis with a, with a shopper. Uh, so it turns out like, you know, as we get deeper and deeper into this crisis, you start going further and further upstream yeah. and trying to like represent a car. That's right. And it, it, it keeps going. I mean, it's like, you know, there's different stages, you know, is it, is it uh, it's, it hasn't, you know, it's build, you know, build to own or whatever uh, is, is like way out. But then there's, you know, it's coming out, out of the factory. We don't yet have all the information yet to, to have it show up in my V auto feed or whatever it is. How do I represent that car? Because I'm selling those cars. I'm not. <laughs> I'm so far upstream, I'm six, nine months out, what am I doing? And you have to, if, if your platform doesn't allow you to sell those cars, you're at a big disadvantage. For sure, for sure. Uh, every time I'm talking to dealers, I ask them, you know, what's the lag time? How long are you waiting for cars? And it, it's just amazing uh, the lack of visibility we have. But one thing uh, I want our listeners to hear from Rudy, not only his transparency and, you know, hey, we are in unprecedented times and, and we're moving as quickly as we can to meet the needs. But, um, you know, your experience at delivering an integrated solution from the beginning of Roadster and then the resources that CDK has given you to simplify the workflows, to integrate the products uh, and moving quickly to give dealers a platform that they can stand up to the OEMs and say, look, this is as good as anything anybody else could create. Don't force another solution. This is a streamlined uh, platform. Uh, that's the end case I'd like to see that the OEMs would set standards. Like you said, what are the KPIs? What are the measurements that they want their retail channel to have? And then let the dealers pick uh, from a handful of of solutions that can meet those KPIs. And, and those KPIs aren't the old ones, right? This is different, right? It's very transactional stuff, right? That's right. Um, how many how many deals have been desked or, or created, right? It's, it's um, you know, certainly the transactions coming out the other side, you want to be measuring that too. You know, shared deals, how many credit applications have gone to the system? How, you know, how many trades have been conducted through through the system? How, you know, F&I products, like all these things can be measured. And if, if you're not thinking that way, you're, you're going to miss the boat. Amen. Amen. Well, Rudy, I want to thank you for your time. This uh, podcast is part of a series, The Road to DMSC. Um, we're really happy to have you as a sponsor this year. And we're really looking forward to getting together with dealers in the Napa Valley, May 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. If you're listening to this podcast, you still have time to buy a ticket and get out to the conference. There's a few dealer tickets 
left. Uh, the entire agenda is on digitalmarketingstrategies.org. That website uh, gives you all the details for hotel booking dates. And we're going to have some amazing discussions. And so I want to encourage the dealer body who's really concerned about protecting the franchise model, uh, innovating through great partnerships with companies like Roadster, and to really learn from their peers on what is really working to, well, create efficient modern retailing, the DMSE conference is for you. And if this is the first time you are listening to one of the podcasts, you should know that I interview innovators, disruptors, and people working with their dealers to create a modern retail experience, just like our conversation here with Rudy and the team at Roadster and CDK Global. So make sure you look at all of the podcast episodes that are available for you to listen to on all your favorite podcast channels. Rudy, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. We're going to be in, we're going to be in Napa together in a few days, yeah. aren't we? Very soon. Looking forward to it. Always great talking to you. That's right. Well, thanks everyone for listening today and I'll see you next time on another podcast show.